Architecture is the learned game, correct and magnificent, of forms assembled in light. Le Corbusier. Chiaroscuro. Chiaroscuro is the Italian word for the design of light and shadow across the surface of the work of art. Chiaro means light, while scuro means dark. In painting, this is straightforward design, but in architecture, light and shadow are created by the massing of objects in sunlight. This requires an understanding of art, design, sunlight, optics, perspective, and the interplay of climate conditions during the day and over the course of the year. Color. In French and British language, the word color is often used. Color is with a U. Color means basically the same thing as chiaroscuro. Chiaroscuro is used to define the massing of objects. Perhaps the best way to show light and shadow is to draw the platonic solids and to show how light moves across the surface. Here I'm just using watercolors, and watercolors are a good start to try to design light and shadow. The problem with watercolors is oftentimes you can't get a very dark uh, dark. So it's important to use other techniques, not just watercolor rendering. In the olden days, architects used to use gouache, which is watercolor with a clay binder to make it look opaque. Another way is to use oil paints instead of watercolors. But here, what I am using is egg tempera. Egg tempera is basically watercolor or tempera with an egg binder. The way you paint with egg tempera is you have to paint using a crosshatch, and this crosshatch pattern becomes part of the, the painting technique. The beautiful thing about egg tempera is that it is semi-transparent, meaning that you actually see through the layers of paint to the layer below it. And this, if you use a cross-hatching technique, allows there to see through multiple layers, creating a, a rich density of, of color that is impossible to achieve with any other medium. When painting a sphere, for example, there is a core shadow, a highlight, reflected light, and a cast shadow. Often, this is also reflected light that illuminates the shadow of the mass. A crisp edge defines a change in surface or shadow, while a soft edge shows variations in a mass. Leonardo da Vinci is one of the first artists to talk extensively about chiaroscuro and is one of the best examples of this technique. In The Virgin of the Rocks, we can see he purposefully designed the painting based on the distribution of light and shadow. Figures emerge from the shadows, like from smoke. In Leonardo's drawings, too, we see he designs using light and shadow. In this drawing of a skull, he uses a silver point technique of drawing lines in the direction of the light. Rodan, the gates of hell. In sculpture, there are countless examples of using light and shadow to design, but the best modern example is Rodin's Gates of Hell. Here, there are countless figures twisting and contorting in agony in hell, but what pulls them all together is the design of light and shadow across the doorway. Rodin almost exclusively designs using light and shadow. In architecture, we can see the Italian Renaissance masters as supreme examples of chiaroscuro. The best known architect from this period is Michelangelo. His drawing style for architecture was to use a pencil smudging technique called sommato, which means emerging from shadow, like smoke. He used this drawing and sculpture technique for architecture and designed light and shadow across the surface of buildings. The Lost Secrets of the Beaux-Arts the Beaux-Arts was the architectural style taught at the École des Beaux-Arts in Paris in the 1800s. This style is often called the Academy method of teaching and spread around the world until the Bauhaus pedagogy of modernism supplanted it in the 1960s. The style was based on Italian and French neoclassical architecture from the Renaissance. The secret to this style of architecture was three components, line, mass, and color. Line was often drawn using pen and ink. Mass was drawn through plan, section, and elevation. Color, or color, was represented in drawings as an ink wash or watercolor wash. This produced a unified and beautiful architecture of line, mass, and light and shadow. 
H. H. Richardson, Trinity Church. We can see line, mass, light, and shadow in the American architect, H. H. Richardson, in the Trinity Church in Boston, Massachusetts. Light and shadow diagrams. The work of Bernard Maybeck, also an American architect, also shows the design of architecture using light and shadow. His Palace of Fine Arts in San Francisco is perhaps his most famous work. Architects design for light and shadow through a series of drawings or diagrams. Often these are not realistic renderings, but just light and shadow studies. The pattern of light and shadow are being designed in an abstract way, because it would be impossible to understand every lighting condition and every experience of it. The second most used technique is drawing a light diagram in plan. This shows sunlight coming in windows and how it changes through the day. South light is drawn often at multiple times during the day and across summer and winter. North light is constant and does not change much throughout the day or year, but is diffuse. This is a plan of a house by Bernard Maybeck and he often designs using light and shadow almost exclusively. Here he's designing thick columns that produce shadow and he is designing lighter elements like the window mullions that produce a, a pattern of light and shadow that's much finer and more detailed. In this way he creates patterns of light and shadow. Some are deep and heavy and some are light and airy. With the trellis system on the outside of the building, he creates this grid pattern of light and shadow that goes across the entire space. And this grid pattern actually defines exterior space on the outside of the building. The most used diagram is the elevation study. Here light is drawn showing shadow across the facade. Patterns of light and shadow are designed using windows as dark elements. Roof overhangs can cast deep shadows across the facade. Textures too can be used to create midtones. One thing that Bernard Maybeck does a lot is to design deep shadows over the eaves of the roof. This makes it seem like the roof is hovering over the spaces below it. The other thing that Bernard Maybeck does is to design the windows, which are a dark element of the windows and use symmetry and, and various um, design techniques to design the light and shadow. So Bernard Maybeck often used watercolors to design the exteriors of his buildings. What this allowed him to do was to investigate the light and the shadow as it played across the, the surfaces of the building, creating very complex patterns and designs. The third most used technique is using the building section for a lighting diagram. This shows how light may enter through windows, skylights, or sunscreens. Le Corbusier, in particular, would design elaborate sunscreens called Brie Soleil. Brie Soleil became a standard practice in modern architecture. This is the Pantheon in Rome, which has a coffered concrete dome and is lit by a central oculus to the sky. This produces constant changing lighting conditions as the sun moves across the sky. The columns at the base cast deep shadows, making the dome look like it's floating above. Here I'm showing the light come in diagrammatically because the light from the oculus is always changing. The coffers are used to create ever-changing patterns of shadow. The drawing itself comes from Frank Ching's book, Architecture, Form, Space, and Order. When I was in school, Ching's drawings were considered the standard that all architecture students should follow. We all thought he was the greatest architectural draftsman of all time. It wasn't until I went to grad school and saw Ching teach at the University of Washington that I realized he just traces photographs using tracing paper. Anyone with no talent could do this. As they say, never meet your heroes. The Pantheon has an oculus that allows light in from the top. As the sun moves through the sky, light moves around the grid of the dome, creating beautiful patterns of light and shadow. One of the most interesting things about the Pantheon is really there aren't any windows or doors in the building. It's, there's just one central oculus in the center of the roof. This creates incredibly dynamic lighting for the building. And the light defines the space, it creates the space. The interior space of the dome is revealed and expressed through the light coming from the oculus. 
The idea of light and shadow in architecture is what has given the longevity to the Pantheon in Rome. It's really a timeless architectural principle and really summed up in the Pantheon. And for this reason, this is why the building is so loved and it has been in operation for more than 2,000 years. In modern mass production, the idea of chiaroscuro in architecture was destroyed. It started with Adolf Loos, an Austrian architect and theorist who argued against ornamentation in architecture. His manifesto, Ornament in Crime, argued against ornamentation and decoration that produced chiaroscuro and instead advocated for smooth, flat surfaces. Further, modernism's love of glass and transparent skins on buildings left no surface on which to design light and shadow. The Miesian idea of a skyscraper is an example, as is Philip Johnson's glass house. With the advent of CAD, architects completely abandoned pencil drawings where gradient lights and darks could be designed and instead drew only lines on paper. The destruction of light and shadow in modern architecture was complete. Yet, this did not mean modern architects completely abandoned light and shadow. Le Corbusier was an example of good architecture that stood by these timeless principles. Ronchamp, for example, is designed around light and shadow and its play across the masses. In postmodernism, there was a return to historical architecture and principles, and a return to ornamentation and architecture. With it was also a return to chiaroscuro. An example is Frank Gehry's blob texture. But what these blob-like massings did was to bring back light's play over the surface of the building and its ever-changing play of light based on sunlight. What does the future hold? Architects are increasingly rendering their presentations using video game technology and movie special effects technology. Autodesk, the makers of AutoCAD, own Maya which is used to create special effects for movies. What we will see is more design of light and shadow in architecture, if for no other reason than the software will be available to architects. So the future is hopeful for the design of light and shadow. As new rendering technologies are developed, architects will be enticed to use them and to design light and shadow in buildings. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, please like and subscribe.